Thank you all for um, coming to my talk on uh, the impact of high-frequency trading in experimental economics. Uh, it's an honor for me to be here uh, this week at UFM. It's actually my first time in Guatemala. Just a quick uh, background about myself. Uh, Professor Clinton already mentioned it. Um, I'm originally from Switzerland in uh, Europe. And I uh, did my undergrad at the University of Basel in Switzerland. And then I had the chance uh, to do a master's program at Chapman University in California. And the program was focused on experimental economics. And so that means for those who don't know, um, that's like a subfield of economics where you uh, perform human-based experiments to test certain economic theories. And so we had like a similar to what you have here at UFM, we have like a behavioral lab with certain computer terminals where we would frequently recruit students from campus and pay them, you know, to participate in some of our economic games and thus analyze their decision making, their interactions, test uh, certain theories, uh, several mechanisms, what makes people cooperate, what um, makes markets converge uh, to efficient outcomes. And then after my degree at Chapman, so at Chapman, this is also where I did uh, this research on high-frequency trading uh, in experimental markets, but uh, upon graduation, I joined a company named uh, MobLab, that's a, a startup company, um, MobLab stands for Mobile Laboratory, and we're based out of uh, Pasadena in California. Uh, we were started by economists from the California Institute of Technology, and we also, uh, we are specialized in uh, experimental economics, but not so much for research, but more like for educational purposes. So basically, we provide a mobile platform that instructors can use in their uh, lectures, lectures on economics and business, to run certain economic games and simulations with their students, to teach them the principles uh, of the textbooks, so that you get like a first hands-on experience. Uh, what is economics, you know, by interacting with your uh, classmates. And so, for today's talk, uh, I've prepared uh, this little outline, so the first part of the talk, I'd like to just um, briefly give you a background about what is uh, high-frequency trading, or HFT. I'm going to use the abbreviation for now, it's just shorter. So I, I give you a quick um, definition, and also a bit, we're going to talk a bit about the history, what uh, were the factors that caused HFT and algorithmic trading uh, to emerge. And then the second point, public opinions and empirical research on HFT. So HFT is a very controversial uh, topic. There are many different opinions and views about it, ranging from it should be banned, it should be you know, regulated completely, and then other views are more like uh, it actually has some beneficial uh, effects or aspects. So we're going to talk about that. And then in the second part, I would like to talk about the specific experimental research that we did uh, at Chapman University about uh, the impact of high-frequency trading. And so we're just going to talk real quick why experimental economics, why economic experiments, what are the benefits of um, economic experiments compared to just, you know, field or empirical uh, research. Uh, we're going to talk about the design and the hypothesis of the experiment and, of course, uh, about the results. And then just a quick conclusion and uh, summary. So let's get started. So I'd like to introduce my talk uh, with this uh, map. And basically what this map shows, it shows the northeast of the United States, right? So we have, we have Chicago here, and we have New York. And between those two cities, the distance is about 900 miles or 800 miles, more than 1,000 kilometers. 
the reason why I'm showing you this map is um, I would like to talk about a certain book. It's called Flash Boys by Michael Lewis that was published in 2014. And that book talks about HFT and opens actually with this map. And this book kind of brought HFT or high frequency trading the first time to the attention of the, the broader public. That was like the first time in 2014 when people, journalists, uh, newspapers started to talk about high frequency trading. And so basically what the, the story behind this map is, is that in 2010, a company named uh, Spread Networks, they built a connection, a dark fiber optic cable, an underground cable, in an as straight as possible line to connect the New York Stock Exchange or other stock exchanges in the New York area with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So these are two trading platforms. One is based, one is based in uh, Chicago and the other one is uh, based in New York. And they spent $300 million to build basically a uh, high quality telephone line or, you know, uh, <laughs> just a, a, fi a fiber optic cable. And so why did they do that? So it turns out this cable reduced the round trip time or the so-called latency that it takes to send a signal from New York to Chicago by one to 1.5 milliseconds. So that's 0 0.001 seconds. So it's a very, very short time frame, right? Uh, it's beyond human capacities, you know, we can, it's more than the, or it's less than the, the, the blink of an eye almost, right? Uh, but they, th those companies, they were willing to invest $300 million to get the speed advantage. And trading firms, especially firms that were engaged in high frequency trading, were almost willing to pay any price to use this cable. And so why were they, they, they willing, um, or why were they so desperate about these speed advantages? And so it turns out with this uh, time advantage, you could generate arbitrage, so-called arbitrage profits between the two exchanges. So just a quick background, the Chicago exchange is mostly for like future contracts and in New York, mostly stocks are traded. And so you could think about it this way if uh, the price for a certain stock in New York, let's say Microsoft, trades at $25.50, and the equivalent financial instrument in Chicago trades at, let's say, $25.51, what you would do is, you would, um, let's see, you would buy in Chicago and sell, uh, you would buy in New York and sell in Chicago and earn like one cent profit, right? So it's a very small profit margin, it's called arbitrage, but if you do this like a thousand times a day, you know, the, the, the profits add up very quickly. And then um, for the remainder of the book, Michael Lewis talks about uh, an investor or a broker at the bank of uh, the Royal Bank of Canada. And this investor, Brad, is the name, Brad Katsuyama, he noticed something when he was trading for his everyday work. So he noticed that whenever, let's say, a client comes to him and says, I want to buy, I don't know, so and so many stocks of IBM or Microsoft, he noticed that on his, let's say, Bloomberg terminal, the moment when he hit on the keyboard, the enter button, the buy button, let's say the, the market price is at $25.26, he noticed that the moment when he hit buy, the price slightly jumped to, from, let's say, $25.26 to $25.27. So he ended up paying a slightly higher price than he originally saw on his Bloomberg terminal when he wanted to execute the order. And how could this happen? And so the short answer, of course, you would guess it, is high-frequency trading. And we're going to talk a bit more about the details. But... Um, Michael Lewis in his book kind of concluded, oh, markets are rigged, they're manipulated, this is unfair, it should be banned. And so in my talk, the goal is to kind of explore these uh, positions a bit more and really get to the ground what is really behind high-frequency trading. What is high-frequency trading? 
So these are two pictures uh, from the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, one is from 1932 and one is from 2007. This is actually the picture that is still prevalent in a lot of people's minds when they think about stock exchanges, right? There's a hectic crowd of brokers that yell at each other, sell, sell, or buy. But it turns actually out nowadays, most of these brokers or floor-based trading has been replaced by uh, computers or so-called um, trading algorithms. So algorithmic trading, uh, there's another abbreviation for computerized trading, algorithmic trading, I will call it AT for now on. And uh, this graphic basically shows you that uh, the percentage of transactions, of contracts that were formed at the, the New York Stock Exchange that were uh, solely conducted by um, or executed by algorithms. So you see in 2000 it was about 15%, and then by 2012, it was 85% of all transactions were actually executed by computers or computer programs. And so there was, a, you could really call it a digital revolution, like in many other fields uh, around that time, that also uh, took place at the, the stock markets or the financial system. High-frequency trading is a, a subset of um, algorithmic trading. So there is no clear kind of um, you know, definition or uh, border between what is high-frequency trading and what is um, algorithmic trading. So many of these um, trading algorithms, they, they pursue very simple strategies. For example, the, the computer program would say, buy so-and-so many stocks of IBM if the price drops below a certain threshold, right? That's very simple. That's the so-called um, limit order. But others, they independently pursue a, a multitude of very complex and sophisticated um, strategies and can act uh, independently. And those are so-called um, high-frequency traders. And uh, so this study from 2017, they estimate that about 10 to 40 percent, so 10 to 40 percent of the Algorithmic trading was uh, conducted by high-frequency trading. And then there's some other estimates for other markets, like foreign exchange market or uh, commodities. And so this is a, there's no, as I said, there's no universal or legal definition of HFT, but these are some key features um, about high-frequency trading uh, that were defined or identified by the Securities and Exchange uh, Commission, kind of the financial authority in the United States. So. As the name says, what they do, they, they use very high speeds, you know, to, and sophisticated pro, uh, computer programs for generating, routing, and executing orders. And the second one is they use co-location services and individual data feeds to minimize latency. So that's related to the map that I showed you in the beginning. And it turns actually out that high-frequency firms, they are willing to pay a lot of rent to build their offices and their servers, their computer, as, as close as possible physically, you know, or geographically to the stock exchanges, just to reduce the length, basically, of the, the cable and thereby the latency that it takes to, to scan the market prices. So this is called um, co-location. Then we have uh, very short time frames for establishing and liquidating positions. So that means high-frequency traders they submit, let's say, an order to buy, and they immediately cancel it. Or they um, submit an order to sell, and then immediately retract it before anyone can even, you know, um, take the order, another agent. Likewise, they immediately, let's say, if they buy a stock, they sell it again within uh, micro or milliseconds. And then this is also an interesting feature. High-frequency traders, they usually end the trading day in a close to flat position as possible. So that means they usually don't carry, if, let's say if they buy shares of Microsoft, they don't carry them overnight. Usually everything that they sell on a day, uh, sorry, everything that they purchase or buy on a day, they also sell on that same day. So it's, it's very kind of different what they do from the traditional uh, investor's uh, perspective. But besides, um, technological advantages or advancements, there were um, other things that kind of drove or led to the emergence of uh, high-frequency trading. 
and there were some regulations and changes in the market structure. So there was a, a government regulation instituted in the U.S. called uh, Regulation National Market System, or short REG NMS, that was passed in 2005, and there's an equivalent one in, in Europe in, t in 2007, that kind of um, the aim of this regulation or this government policy was to enhance competition among the different stock markets in the U.S. and kind of unite their trading books to kind of uh, universalize uh, them. And so today, just in the U.S. alone, there is 11 major stock exchanges, 11 different uh, trading platforms, and 50 more alternative trading platforms. So before 2000, the stock market used to be mostly New York-centered, right? Centered around uh, the New York Stock Exchange, maybe NASDAQ, but then with this policy, um, the government or the SEC, it was kind of an attempt to enhance competition. And of course, as economists, we think, oh, that doesn't sound too bad, right? Uh, enhancing competition, that this should be a good thing. But then there was kind of a catch, and that's going to be important for the, the future or the, the later talk. Uh, REC NMS, or National Market System, uh, one feature of this policy was the so-called trade-through rule, which requires a broker or a trader that, you know, trades on behalf of a client to guarantee the best price for a particular share currently traded at any market for a client. So this is the so-called national best bid or offer. So what does that mean? That means, for example, if I'm a broker and somebody, you come to me and you say, I would like to purchase so and so many shares, let's say 50 shares of Microsoft. That means I have to look, let's say, at the New York Stock Exchange, what is the price there for Microsoft? And I have to look at this, this other exchange, okay, what is the price there? And then I might say, okay, the 10 cheapest shares are at the New York Stock Exchange, I'm going to buy them there. Then I'm going to buy 15 more here, the next cheapest ones, and then 25 more here. So you execute your order across these various um, trading platforms, and you're required by law to do so. So you have to search kind of the entire um, uh, network of financial stock exchanges. And so this is kind of a graphical illustration of this, this fragmentation. So this was like before this fragmentation, it was mostly investors. They would go to a broker, would then go to the, the New York Stock Exchange and uh, execute this order. But with this uh, fragmentation, of the stock market, many so-called alternative trading platforms uh, emerged. And so it's, it's not surprising that in such a fragmented environment, speed advantages would become very, very important and key for success. Because whoever is able to monitor all the different stock exchanges in the closest to real time has definitely an advantage. And so that actually uh, led to another kind of controversial uh, practice that high-frequency traders uh, started to implement at the beginning of, let's say, the, or the late 2000s. So how do high-frequency traders uh, use their speed? So this is related to what I told you earlier about this uh, trader in the book of uh, Michael Lewis uh, called Flash Boys. When he bought the shares, right, Whenever he, his, he executed the buy order or he submitted the, the buy order on his, let's say, Bloomberg terminal, uh, he saw the price slightly jump. And so, um, let's, let's take a look at this graphic. So let's, let's say I'm, I'm this trader and the client comes to me and says, I want to purchase 500 shares of IBM or something. And... Then I place this order to the market with my software and the order reaches the geographically closest stock exchange or the, just the, the exchange where the best national best bid or offer is. And I start executing parts of my order there. And then I go to the next exchange and I start executing parts of the order there, wherever you know the currently best price is. And so high frequency traders or companies that are engaged in high-frequency trading, 
through their shorter lines and their speed advantages, they're able to kind of scan the entire you know, market system with just you know, a few milliseconds faster than the regular traders. And so they will notice if a large order, it's mostly for high volume orders, is executing at this stock exchange and at that stock ex exchange. So they can, um, through their trading algorithms, they can try to predict with a certain probability that somebody is right now trying to purchase IBM stocks. So what, will, what they will do is, once they have certain confidence, and I'm, I'm, when I say they, I mean the, the computer algorithms, everything that I'm talking to it happens within fractions of a second. If they have certain confidence that, okay, somebody is executing or planning to buy a large amount of uh, IBM shares, they will race ahead of you to the other stock exchanges and buy before you all the good offers and post new offers at slightly higher prices. And so that's what uh, Brad, the character in that book by Michael Lewis uh, experienced, whenever he wanted to purchase the stock, the price slightly jumped, you know, just by a few cents. But of course, Brad, as someone who does trading in his everyday life, executing large market orders, he noticed that, right? And uh, it started to, to accumulate. And of course, this, it's not surprising that this practice is very controversial, right? You could say, it's very unfair, right? I mean, someone just who is faster can race ahead of you and kind of, uh, Michael Lewis calls that front running. Um, and then another controversial thing about uh, high frequency trading are so-called um, flash crashes. So this is a pretty cool graphic. I don't know um, if you follow the, the stock markets. In 2010, the Dow Jones industrial average just dropped by almost uh, 1,000 points within, what is this, just a few minutes and immediately bounced back. And you have to, have, you have to imagine, this happened within seconds, minutes, right? And nobody really knew what was going on because, you know, 80% 80, 80 of trades are executed by algorithms. And so people were like, whoa, what's going on there? Like, how could this happen, right? And so the first um, people or uh, practices that got blamed was, of course, high-frequency trading, and everybody was like, oh, let's ban high-frequency trading. This is, they are to blame. But then, and actually, on September 2nd uh, in 2013, Italy became the, the world's first country who introduced a, a specific tax on high-frequency traders, or like stocks that are held for less than, what is this, 0.5 seconds. So if you if you buy a stock and you sell it within less than five, uh, 0.5 seconds, then you pay a certain tax. But later, actually, it turned out that this, um, this crash, it was not, the cause was not a high-frequency trader. It was actually caused by uh, uh, an error in a regular algorithmic trade that kind of caused this. But there's no doubt that um, high-frequency traders kind of helped to accelerate this shock, but also helped to kind of... Um, bounce it back. And so, you know, with these um, controversies, you know, we saw this, 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 um, this practice of front running when high frequency traders just use their speed advantages to employ regular slower traders and these flash crashes. This is just one example, by the way. There, there was a, a, a deep need, you know, to, to conduct more research on high-frequency trading and uh, algorithmic trading. And so, uh, researchers at many universities, you know, they analyzed market data, compared it with before 2000, 2010, and afterwards. And so, it's actually surprising that most um, academic studies, they conclude that high-frequency trading improves the markets. You know, that speed advantages um, uh, help the market. And it's just because over the years, if you look at the market data before 2000 or 2010, if you look at market uh, indicators such as uh, volatility or the bid-ask spreads, the costs of trading, the book depth, they have improved um, over this time. But it's very hard to determine 
what was the, the cause of that improvement? Was it just like the digital revolution? Was it the enhanced competition? Or was it the speeds, the high-frequency traders? And so I, I just brought this quote from this study by Jones in 2013. Um, he says, empirically, so for researchers, it's very challenging to measure the incremental or the isolated uh, effect of high-frequency trading on top of all other changes in equity markets. You know, there's so many other changes that are going on every day, right? And so we do not, to, we do not get to observe the counterfactual, which in this case would be a world without HFT. So, you know, as a researcher, ideally you always want to have like, A-B studies or A-B testing, right? You want to look at the environment uh, with HFT and then without HFT and then you compare them. But in the real world, this is nearly impossible because right now everyone has access, you know, to, to sophisticated computers, to low latency infrastructure. So it's hard to determine whether the improvement of market quality over the last years was... Um, because of HFT, or was um, impeded by HFT, or if HFT had no f effect at all, right? We, we, we just, it's very hard to determine that, the isolated effect. And with that, uh, I would like to uh, actually switch to the research um, that I did, and that was kind of the motivation for the experiment that we did, because experimental economics, in any field, you know, of economics, really uh, allows you to do that, what I just said. You can kind of, in an isolated laboratory environment, you can study the isolated impact of a certain treatment, in that case, uh, high-frequency trading. So I'm going to talk about that a bit more, but I think first I'd like to give you a quick uh, chance to ask any questions, if there were any questions about the, the first part. Yes, sir. It is the way to scan, stop or limit orders before they execute. Limit orders. Yes. Yes. Very good question, and we're going to talk about that um, later uh, during my talk. So, it is mostly market orders that are subject high volume market orders that are very vulnerable that can you know be targeted by high frequency traders. As a limit order, you know, if you say, I want to buy that stock if the price drops below 50, you're going to receive a price. Uh, you're going to pay a price of 50 guaranteed, right? Or because it's just um, by the definition of that order. So that's a very good point, and we'll actually get back to that uh, later in the talk. Does, does everyone kind of know the difference between a limit order and a, a market order? So limit order is like, I'm willing to buy at 50, and you just wait till a seller accepts your 50. But a market order is, you say, I want to buy now, I accept whatever the current market price is. Yes, does, please. Does high frequency trading actually harms the profits of people who don't have access to that algorithms? Um, yeah, I mean, th that's a great question. We're going to talk about this a bit further, but I want to say this, far, this much uh, right now. Again, so the, the research is very um, kind of in favor of high frequency traders or algorithmic trading in general, they say the enhanced competition, the advancements in technology reduce the fees on the stock markets. So it costs for you as a broker or also, I mean, all cost reductions are ideally passed on to the, to the clients, to the investors. Um, you get to benefit from that. But then, of course, there are certain strategies. I mean, if you see that, and especially if you're a broker, then it, it harms you, and let's say if you're the client of a broker, then the higher price that your broker paid will eventually be passed on to you, right? So, um, and that's really, the, that question was really the, the motivation behind the experiment that uh, we're going to, to talk about, to really study that uh, incremental impact of certain high-frequency trading strategies. So, very good question. Um, maybe... If there one more question, then we can talk on just for the sake of time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so very good question. That was kind of the motivation. We really wanted to study the incremental impact of a um, high-frequency trading on everyday traders, you know. And so 
to study the isolated impact, we, we, con we conducted this laboratory study where we had uh, two treatments, basically a high-frequency treatment and a treatment without high-frequency trading. And just to give you a quick uh, background on the research with economic experiments, so that person, uh, this is one of the founding fathers of experimental economics, uh, I'm sure some of you know him, so that is uh, Vernon Smith, who was um, the first one who actually showed in a laboratory experiment where, let's say, you have some buyers and some sellers, and you let them trade with one another, that the market converges to what the theory would predict, right, to the equilibrium price and the equilibrium qu uh, um, quantity. So that's uh, that. That's actually an example that I um, conducted with MobLab at the University of California in San Diego. And so basically, we had a classroom like this, and we said, okay, half of you are going to be buyers, and the other half of you are going to be sellers. And the cool thing with MobLab is really it allows students to participate, um, you know, with their, their phones, their laptops. You can execute and make trades, post bids and asks from your phones, and trade with your, your students. And so the buyers, um, they had values, and the sellers had costs, and you know, I'm going to talk a bit about that later, but then when we, when we run this market, you see at the beginning, the, the red dots are all the transactions that happened. And you see at the beginning, there's a lot of like noise. People try to figure out what is the equilibrium price, but we have like a convergence to the, the equilibrium price, right? So the equilibrium in this configuration was $1.04. And Vernon Smith was kind of the first one who showed in a uh, laboratory study that markets are a very effective mechanism to, you know, to, to allocate uh, goods or services. And many uh, experimental studies have later been conducted using this um, basic framework that uh, Vernon provided us to study certain policies on markets and uh, trading. And so there's some more details, you know, where this um, equilibrium, the theoretic equilibrium in an experiment comes from. So as I said, half of you would be buyers. And as a buyer, you are given a certain value or kind of a willingness to pay. And so your goal in this market was to, to purchase uh, goods at a price ideally less than your, your value to make a, a payoff. So your, your payoff would have been your value minus the price that you paid in the, the experiment to, to obtain the stock. And if we sort and order all values by all the buyers in the experiment, then we get our demand uh, curve in this market. So the demand in this market is kind of represented by all the, the values uh, by the buyers in this market. And likewise, um, the sellers, instead of values, they had costs at which they could provide a certain good or share. And so as the seller, it was your goal to sell your shares at a price higher or greater than, than your costs, right, to make a, a payoff. And again, if we sort and order all the costs, you have to imagine every seller in the room had three or five costs. Uh, if we sort and order them, and plot them, then we get a nice uh, supply curve, right? The supply in this experimental market. And if we, you know, overlap them, then we have supply and demand. We have a theoretic equilibrium prediction and also an equilibrium quantity, or in this case, it's kind of a range between 20 and 25. And this was the, the framework of our uh, experimental market for this experimental study. So in equilibrium... We would predict that if we, we run this session, and later on, I think I will show you the details, we run like, um, I think we ran six sessions for the no high frequency trading treatment and six sessions uh, for the treatment with high frequency trading. And each uh, session was composed of different trading periods. And so for each period, we would predict that there should be between 20 and 25 transactions. And then this is... Uh, Mathematically, how the demand function looked like, where the, the values of the buyers were drawn. And so the, the main takeaway uh, of this is 
that we added this X. So across rounds, we kind of vertically shifted the supply and demand graph. So it was, it was always 20 to 25 shares, but we kind of vertically shifted it each trading period. So each session was composed of 20 trading periods. So you have to imagine students, they came, and it was like, I think it was four buyers and five sellers. And we, um, we put them in the lab and let them trade for 20 trading periods. And each trading period was maybe, I think it was three minutes or three and a half minutes. And so each uh, trading period, they had new values and new shares. If you were a buyer, you were always a buyer. If you were a seller, you were always a seller. But each uh, period, you had new values, and you had to rediscover the equilibrium. And so this just shows you. So we had 20 periods. You see, sometimes the equilibrium was um, 75, then it was this, and so on. And so obviously, the participants, they didn't know all of that, right? They, they only saw their personal private values or their, if they were a seller, their personal private costs. And then we told them, okay, now trade with your, uh, with your classmates in this room. And there was also an exchange rate that the earnings that you made in the experiment, you were later rewarded in US dollars. So on average, students, they actually made $20 per session. So that was kind of the motivation. But of course, we incentivized students so that the better they traded, the more they, they would get paid out at the end of the experiment. So that's usually a common practice in experimental economics that you incentivize the subjects, uh, mostly with monetary incentives. And then um, this was what the interface uh, looked like. So I know this is a bit small, but this is by a, the buyer. So you, were, you had your values here. This is kind of, you see all the transactions that happened in this market. So you see the first transaction was made at 100, and then a little bit less, and so on. And so these are all the transactions by all other players in the market that you're at. And you could use this kind of as an orientation, what you think, based on the previous prices, what is a reasonable price. And so, of course, as a buyer, it was your goal to, to um, purchase goods, ideally as a price beneath your value to make a profit. So in this case, his first value, he bought a share for 98 cents. So this, it's a little bit small, but it says 120 is his value and 98 is the price that he paid. So 120 minus 98, the profit was 22. And that goes back to the, the question about the, the limit orders and market orders uh, that you had. So you could purchase two ways. You could either just, um, just submit a market order and kind of accept these are all the offers by the sellers at which they're willing uh, to, to sell you the good. Just accept kind of the, the lowest current price in this market. Or you could place your own bid and say, okay, I'm willing to buy at 74. So you would type in here 74, then your bid would show up along with all other bids posted by the seller in this market. And you would just wait until a seller accepts your 74. So you see kind of the difference between the, the limit order and the market order. So the, the market order, if you just say, I want to sell, hey, I want to buy now, then you just accept whatever is the, the current market price, right, what you see. And so naturally, it can be, even in a, in a, in a treatment without high-frequency trading, right? Let's say you see here there's 80, and you want to buy that but somebody is slightly faster than you. You know, it can happen. Somebody at the same time thinks, I want to buy that, and he just clicks the button a bit earlier on the computer. Then he buys at 80, but you, you actually end up with the next best price. You end up with 82. So you paid $2 more than you originally uh, wanted. And so that's going to be key later uh, for the experiment. And then again, limit order is just, you're kind of on the safe side. You say, hey, I'm not willing to pay more than 74, so you place a bid of 74, and then you just wait till a seller accepts it. But of course, it could be that it never gets accepted, and you end up with not buying any share. So that's kind of the, the difference between the two, the two types of orders. And so this is what I already said. So we had, um, well, for each treatment, we have eight sessions composed of 20 trading periods. 
and then kind of the catch that we implemented to make this more like reflective of a high frequency environment. We wanted really speed advantages to matter. And so we imposed a three second time delay for all actions that were made by the students or by the humans in this market. So this is kind of the key feature about this, this treatment. Normally, whenever you hit, let's say you say, okay, I want to buy at 80, then it gets immediately executed, right? But we said, okay, let's say if you click, I want to buy at 80, it would take three seconds for your signal to reach the market, and then you would just buy the stock at whatever price the, the, the market price is after three seconds. You know, and most likely if there's no high frequency trading, it's still going to be 80, but there's the, the time delay just uh, increased kind of the risk that somebody was uh, submitting a similar market order slightly a few seconds before you, and you would not end up with the, the price that you actually wanted. So we kind of slowed down uh, the human traders in this market. And the same thing was true for limit orders. Let's say you wanted to submit a limit order to buy at 74. It would take three seconds until your limit order shows up uh, in the market book. And the same was true also for retracting orders if you wanted to take back a limit order. So for the control group, or just I, I call it the latency treatment, this was like the treatment without HFT, we just had this time delay. So we told students, hey, you're going to be trading in this experimental market and just be aware that each action that you take, uh, there's going to be a, a three second time delay. And we also told them, uh, or made them aware about the risk of this time delay. We told them, okay, it could be that if you hit market order, that the price after three seconds is no longer available and you just end up with the next best price, right? And then for the high frequency trading treatment, we imposed an HFT um, algorithm that would target students' market orders, similar to the way um, what we saw earlier. They would kind of race ahead of you and kind of exploit your orders. So that was one strategy, and then the other strategy was just they would uh, make arbitrage profits whenever there was like an overlap between limit orders. We're going to get a bit more into the details. But what I want to say is what we did in the experiment was basically what high frequency traders do in a very simplified way and in also a very extreme way. Basically, each time somebody submitted a market order, the high frequency trader would exploit it. So we, our goal, and this is, I think, a, a common practice uh, for experimental research, especially when it's the first kind of experiment about a certain topic, you create a very polar case, right? You have this environment where there's no high frequency trading, and then you have one here where there's two or one very brutal strategy that is probably more extreme than in the reality, just to kind of study if there is a difference or if there is a, you know, a difference between market quality between the two treatments, then hopefully in this treatment we're going to detect it. And so let's, let's talk about the, the first high-frequency trading uh, strategy. So let's say this is the market book and you are a seller and you say, so you see here the highest bits currently posted by the buyers and the, the, the other uh, asks uh, by the sellers. So a bid is basically a limit order to buy and an ask is a limit order to sell. And let's say you wanted to post uh, another limit order to sell for 33. Now what you will notice is that this limit order is actually lower than the highest standing bid, right? So you're basically willing to accept a price that is lower than what this guy is currently bidding, right? So in regular auctions, the rule is usually that you execute the transaction in whatever the currently highest or standing bid is. So, but what we did is, uh, due to this time delay, we had kind of a, a queue to which all actions uh, were listed before they reached the market. And so, you, you have to look at this from top to bottom. So here is the seller's limit order for 33. 
And then the high frequency trader, he had like a speed advantage. He wasn't subject to that three um, second time delay. He placed two orders in front of you. Uh, one order was to sell and another one was to buy. So basically what the high frequency trader did, let's say right at the moment when you placed this 33, the high frequency trader would um, purchase, or no, would sell for 35, and he would um, place an order by its own at 33. So what happens next is my order of 33 reaches the market, and I make a contract at 33. So instead of selling at 35, you basically sold at 33, which is, to be fair, still what you originally were uh, willing to, to, to sell, right? But in an environment without high-frequency traders and when there's no one faster than you, you would have sold at uh, 35. And so, of course, the high-frequency trader makes a profit of, of $2. So that's, that's one strategy. The, the HFT just um, exploited any kind of arbitrage opportunity that might have um, arisen from this time delay. And then the other one, uh, we called it front-running market orders. This is this controversial strategy where somebody places a market order and then the HFT races ahead of you and purchases the order before you and then posts a slightly um, higher price. So you end up paying more than you originally, uh, what, than what the price was originally when you submitted the order. So let's, let's take a look at what this looks like. So this time, imagine we are a buyer, and we just want to buy a share right now. And we see the lowest current price, the moment when, he, when we um, hit the buy button, is 40. So I say, OK, I want to buy at 40. What happens is my market order gets again added to the queue, and the high-frequency trader placed two bits of his own in front of you. And so basically what the high-frequency trader would do is he would place a bid to buy at 40 and then place a limit order to sell at a slightly lower price what the next best bid in the book is. So and what that looks like is first the high-frequency trader takes the 40 and then he posts a limit order to sell at 44.9. And so now, now my bid to buy comes and instead of originally at 40, I, I buy at 44.9. So I pay $4.09 more than I originally saw, right? And so that results in an arbitrage profit for the high frequency trader of $4.9. Uh, and just some other details about the two treatments. We didn't tell subjects that there's a high frequency trader. And the reason we did that, we, we told them there's a time delay and you have to be aware if someone is faster than you, uh, you might not end up um, receiving the price that you saw when you submit the order. But other than that, we didn't tell them that there's a high frequency trader. So they were exactly the same instructions and the reason we wanted to do that was, or we did that was really that any potential difference between the two treatments would arise endogenously just from the behavior or the trading behavior of the, the students. And so uh, we conducted this uh, series of experiments, and these are kind of the, the key variables that we looked at. Um, volatility, the price volatility in the market, which is basically the standard deviation of all um, contracts. Then the allocative efficiency, so this is related to, if we just go back real quick, um, here. So there's a, a theoretic surplus that can be achieved in such a market, and we just analyzed how close people converge to that theoretic surplus. This is kind of a proxy for the efficiency in a market. And then we looked at bid-ask spread. This is kind of the, the difference between the lowest standing ask and the highest standing bid, and it's kind of uh, a proxy for the, the trading costs or kind of the round-trip costs in any market. So lower spreads are usually better for traders, that means if you bought a stock and you want to sell it again, you don't lose uh, too much money. And then book depth is a measurement for how many bids there are, or how many asks and how many bids there are currently posted in the order book. 
So the more orders there are in a book or in the market book, the, you can say the more liquid that market is. That means there are more opportunities if you want to sell something. There are many people who are willing to buy from you. And if you want to buy something, there are many people who want to sell from you. So, and we, we, we used for bit depth and um, for order depth or book depth and for bid ask spread, we just use a time weighted average uh, for all trading uh, periods. And then, of course, the, our hypothesis was is there any difference between the two treatments uh, for these measurements? And so, this is um, just the interface again for the control group. And then, what we saw for the so this converges pretty nicely, you know, as economic theory would predict. No high frequency traders, they reach this quantity, equilibrium quantity of 2025. So this is just a sample uh, period. But this is now for the high frequency trading uh, treatment. And you see, if you look at these two, so there were like 22 transactions. With the high frequency traders, we had trading volumes of up to 40. And that's just because the high frequency trader acted kind of as a middleman buying and immediately selling to, to, to subjects. So almost in, I think, more than 90% of all contracts, a high-frequency trader acted as a middleman between the buyers and the sellers. And so the, the trading volume was almost double than what it was without um, uh, the high-frequency traders. So this is what this looks like if you plot it here. So um, significantly higher... Uh, trading volume. However, I want to say if you filter out, and this is what we're going to talk about later, if you filter out the high frequency trades, whenever, let's say, I buy from a seller and I, I, I sell to a buyer as the high frequency trader, that kind of counts as two trades. But if we only count the high frequency traders as, as one trade, we actually uh, observe that they are still very close to the, the equilibrium. And so, of course, um, trading volume. So, so here we see in the high frequency treatment, there was 37.75 was the, the mean number of contracts formed uh, in the, the market. Whereas in the, the latency treatment without HFT, it was only 22.21. But now this is the important uh, thing and kind of the main takeaway of the talk. If we look at efficiency, like how uh, efficient was the allocation in this market or the outcome, there was no statistical difference between the high frequency trading treatment and the control group. So both markets achieved very efficient outcomes close to 100%. So this is a, as a percentage, you can look at that. So there was no statistical significant difference uh, between the two markets. And then the same for the bid-ask spread. This is what I told you, kind of the, the time-weighted average across the periods between the lowest standing ask and the highest standing bid. Uh, you see, it was slightly lower, actually, which is good, you would say, in the high-frequency trading treatment than in the latency treatment. But again, it was not statistically uh, significant. And the same for book depth. You know, remember how many orders are in the market book, how many limit orders are there at any given point of time. Uh, it was slightly higher in the control group, but again, no statistical difference. But then, of course, if we look at the subject earnings, like how much money the, the students made, it's not surprising that in the control group, they made more money on average than in the high-frequency trading average. So this is maybe a little bit less than 10% more, right? So there was a sti statistical difference um, between the two groups, which is not surprising because that's how we designed the, the market, right? And so that's maybe back to, to your question. That there's definitely, if you have this, this brutal environment where, you know, uh, subjects don't even know that there's high-frequency trading and they just act as if they don't know, and then there's definitely some uh, potential for exploitation. But then again, if, if we look at another uh, indicator for market quality, which is volatility, you know, how volatile are the prices, there was, see these numbers are very close, so there was no statistical difference uh, between the, the two markets or the, the between the two treatments. 
And so what are the conclusions? So as expected, the high frequency trader increased the trading volume and it decreased uh, the earnings of the non-high frequency traders. But we do not find that these high frequency trading strategies and again, in this experiment, they were very brutal. This is not necessarily you know, how it is in the real world. It's like a simplified, polarized uh, environment. But even in this very polarized uh, environment, where you have these predatory strategies, there was no uh, reduction in market quality based on the, the standard measures. And traders, they have technically the option to kind of mitigate or avoid the high-frequency trader by um, submitting market orders instead of uh, limit orders. No, sorry, sorry, I take that back. By submitting limit orders instead of market orders. So market order is the one where you say, I want to buy now, and that kind of gives the high-frequency trader or other strategies room you know, to, to really exploit you. Whereas if you just submit limit orders, you're guaranteed to re receive at least the price uh, that you that you posted right, and so what is kind of my main takeaway that I want to give you from this? So, as you saw in the beginning, high frequency trading in the broader public, in the news, in this book by Michael Lewis, even by I think the video that you were sent. Who watched the video yesterday? There was a video sent. The the video I think does a very great job in explaining what high frequency trading is. But it is also very opinionated. It says, oh, high-frequency trading should be banned, should be regulated. Um, but as we have seen in the talk, we have to be very careful if we impose uh, regulations, right? Because this regulation national market system was actually originally something that prepared the stage for high-frequency traders. So we need to be very careful if we let's say, as a policymaker, impose another regulation because we often do not know what the uh, side effects of uh, uh, regulations are. And so that's why I really like um, this um, quote by F.A. Hayek. And I just posted this here also because we're at uh, UFM and we uh, Austrian economics. But I always uh, like this, this quote, right? It's, the curious tasks of, uh, or task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design. And so this, it sounds very complicated, and I have to admit, it, it took me a few times to, to read that because I, be, before I fully apprehended it, but it's, it talks about men, right? Men want to design stuff. They want to, especially policymakers, they say, okay, let's ban high-frequency trading, or let's Let's impose a regulation that increases uh, competition among markets. Um, oftentimes, when we implement uh, a policy or a regulation, there are side effects, you know, unknown side effects. And some of them can be unwanted. So in the case of regulation national market system, nobody kind of knew that this regulation would actually be something that acts in, in favor of high-frequency trading. So the task of economics is really to, to analyze these complex structures of economics and to really help people to make, who are policymakers, to make smart decisions uh, about um, regulations and policies. And sometimes no regulation is better than any regulation. You know, this is, I think, also an important lesson that sometimes, uh, how do you say, the the treatment is worse than the disease, right, if, with a patient. So with that, um, I'm at the end uh, of my talk. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay.